I'll save some time when I can. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce our next speaker um, from IBM. Um, Paddy Fagan is a senior technical staff member and chief architect for Watson Care Manager and the application framework at IBM Watson Health. He's an expert in the architecture and design of enterprise business applications and has worked across software as a service and on-premises solutions in healthcare and government for over 20 years. And today, Paddy's going to talk to us about uh, a standard that we see as uh, very important and an important part of uh, the, the whole framework of digital standards, the Open Agile Architecture Standard. So warm virtual welcome from the open group for paddy fagan welcome sir steve uh, and everyone else good afternoon or good morning possibly good evening depending on where you are and um, i'm yes, going to start we, again we have people here paddy for whom it's already wednesday um in, in japan so welcome good lord welcome from the future um listen uh, thank you very much steve and as steve said i'm going to talk a little bit about open agile architecture and how that sort of interlocks, I guess, with the Digital First Enterprise. Very briefly, as Steve said, my name is Paddy Fagan and I'm an SDSM working in IBM Watson Health. Um, I've been around enterprise applications for about, uh, well, almost 25 years at this stage. So I kind of a lot of history to draw on, but um, but hopefully that that is a help rather than a hindrance in this. But um, yeah, so let's get on. Um, as ever, when I speak at these kind of events, I note that I'm Irish and I speak quite quickly. So if I am speaking too fast and people can't hear me, please just raise your hand or put a note in the chat and we'll see it and I'll slow down, I promise. Um, I'm going to talk today about a couple of key topics around the OAA. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the OAA is itself, which hopefully is an introduction that might be useful. Um, and then sort of expand on sort of two of the key topics within it, really that division between what the enterprise does um, uh, and also what the enterprise is. Um, so in that, you know, it's going to draw it on that distinction. It's one of the key sort of distinctions we document in the OAA and we feel it's important to this and how it fits in with things. And hopefully in drawing out that distinction, I can also um, Sort of draw on those two topics and 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 draw in a little bit more, and um, I am going to note the picture that's on the leftmost edge of this diagram shows sort of two hands drawing each other with pencils. Now, ignoring for a moment the impossibility of such a drawing, and um, I guess the thing that that's kind of key in this is a theme that runs through the OAA, and that's one of a digital enterprise and an agile enterprise being kind of co-linked. And I guess in our minds and from the perspective of the OAA, if you want one, you're going to end up with the other. Now, I'd argue that's not a bad thing, but I guess, you know, it raised that question of an organization approaching this and thinking that what they're doing is a, a digital transformation and finding themselves thrust into an agile transformation or vice versa. And I guess maybe that insight, therefore, is is useful to people in terms of, you know, highlighting that the two are co-linked. And so when you start down the journey of one, you should expect to draw some of the other in. So onwards to, to what is the OAA? So the Open Agile Architecture Standard, long phraseology, but there you go, covers the digital transformation of the enterprise together with the agile transformation. So back to those two hands, right? And, and, and that's a key concept in what we're trying to address here because because we believe in order to address one, we have to address the two. It's broken down internally into a sort of an OAA core, which covers the concepts and the structure, um, and then goes on to why you need this dual transformation, why attempting to do one without the other has, is going to, to generate issues and, and, and constraints. And then we have the OAA building blocks in the later sections of the document, which really develop on those key topics and structures um, and, and provide a lot more detail and some examples and various, you know, constructs, I suppose, to bring them to life, hopefully. And um, it includes concepts or content from the perspective uh, of what the enterprise does. So, you know, that's about product design or journey mapping um, to what the enterprise is, which is, you know, the project product architecture, the operations architecture, indeed your organizational structure or architecture it might be. Um, and I guess, you know, again, those distinctions 
sometimes feel a little artificial, but they're also kind of key to what we're trying to drive at here. And I suppose, I guess, you know, the key thing I would draw out is if, if we think about looking back up this slide across those divisions between what the organization is um, and what it does, the distinction between a digital transformation and an agile transformation, you need to take on all of these things, or at least elements of all of them in our minds to be successful. And that's what we hopefully draw together in the OAA. So hopefully with that introduction, having made some sense um, and um, let me move onwards. So I'm gonna talk briefly um, about what the organization, sorry, I confused myself, what the organization does, apologies. Um, and I guess, you know, at the key level, right, what we're talking about here is archi architecting the enterprise to innovate at speed and scale, right? And I guess what we're, you know, driving at here is to say that if you're gonna undergo a digital transformation or in the throes of a di digital transformation, you need to get to that um, innovation at speed and scale. And I guess a lot of this, in, uh, in some ways that I didn't quite expect interlocks with um, what Dave was saying as I joined the call, right? There's a lot of these kinds of things that we're talking about here are very much part of what Dave described in the way that the open group's gonna change how some of the standards are de developed and delivered, right? Um, but there are other elements to this that affect, you know, how the organization um, does things. It's about learning at scale. It's about architecting products for faster innovation or fast innovation. And it's about an operating model that scales. And I guess, you know, those two things together become particularly important when we start to talk about, you know, internet delivered or SaaS applications. And um, both the architecture and the operating model have to align to allow you to innovate quickly. And I guess, you know, the heart of digital is quick innovation. And so th this becomes very much part of that. And um, you then have modular software systems. And again, I guess, you know, relating back to Dave's uh, commentary, in, in terms of breaking things down so that individual pieces can evolve more rapidly and that we can provide, you know, that faster route to feedback at an organizational level as well, it becomes important. And then the final one here is what's called an inverse Conway to shape the organization. So we, the Conway's law is a, a architectural or software law, of course, none of these are, you know, written in statutes anywhere, but nonetheless, that says that your organization structure will influence or inform your solution architecture, your software architecture. And I guess what, what Inverse Conway talks to is to say, well, if that's true, and we believe it does, and I think we've all, hopefully everybody on this call has lived examples where that has, has written through, said, well, if I can control what my organization does in terms of how it's structured, well, then perhaps I can organize my, um, my organization to generate the architecture I want. Yeah, it feels a little bit like the techies trying to take over the, the enterprise, but, but hopefully that you know, makes some sense and resonates with people in terms of that understanding. I talk in a little bit more detail about a few of these topics in the slides that follow. Um, so let me move on. Um, and I guess the first one of these is, is you know, bold learning at scale, right? And, and what we're trying to drive here is, you know, a, a one of iterative um, innovation that, that allows us to, you know, do some research, do some product uh, discovery, ideate it, test and learn from that and, and iterate on that and refine very quickly, you know, up the slope of addressing more and more needs and, and iterating across solution ideas so that we drive to something that, that has the right value proposition, it has the right product features, it has the killer UI, I guess, you know, you can all define that as, as, as you see fit. But, but what you wanna be able to do is iterate on that process, not to sit in a, a darkened conference room or a darkened WebEx or whatever it might be these days and say, we're gonna build the killer product for this market. It's gonna do A, B, C, D, E, and F, never look outside of the room, go build that and see what happens. Rather, you know, we take the idea, we play it back to people, we show them, you know, whether it's mock-ups or um, whatever um, sort of a presentation of it to show them what it might look like. We get their feedback, we iterate on that, we produce another iteration and we repeat that multiple times. And in doing that, we generate something with a much stronger value proposition with much better set of features. Um, and with a you know a, a better uh, killer UI or, or MVP or um, you know key uh, product characteristics, and and I guess you know this is about you know 
the organization being willing to learn like this and being party to learn like this, but also being, you know, bought into it, right? And and I guess, you know, part of what we all do is to shape organizational thinking as well as solutions and software and everything else. And so this is very much part of the process in our mind. And it's one of the, the tenants, as I said, of the document. If I move on to the next slide, and um, and this talks about an, an operating model that scales. And I guess, you know, if we think about this, we've got at the very left hand side here some fairly um well understood blocks, right? You've got product architecture, and I hope sort of for the sort of audience we're talking to, that makes a lot of sense in terms of what you might have in there. But you also have um an agile strategy about how you want to be agile and how you want that agility to take form. And, and those two together sort of drive your operational objectives, your OKRs about how you want your organization to change or evolve or what you want to deliver. And then you have that operationalization of it, right? And those are, you know, journeys and value stream processes that sort of run across the top, but you also have people, employees who are probably a very key part of this. You have automation and that automation may be, you know, software automation, CI, CD pipelines or other components and um, but it could also be mechanical automation depending on what your organization produces right and you've got assets and and those assets might be you know manuals or documents or standards in the case of uh, um, the open group as, as dave talked about but they could be other things as well right they may be internal documents about how things are done or how processes run or how about refinements that might be made or could be made or whatever and um, and then at the end of that, you've got these operational outcomes, hopefully leading you know to product outcomes and the delighted client at the end, but also feeding that you know that 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 circle back into the product architecture, into the improvements and redesign in the operations that let you iterate on this model and evolve in an agile way. And I guess that's the other you know key piece of this is that agility in the process. So if I jump on, I guess we're going to talk in the next section about what the enterprise is. Um, and so here we have first up the inverse Conway. Um, and so, you know, this is this idea that by organizing our organization, okay, I've, I've phrased that terribly, but bear with me, um, in a way that, that drives the the agile transformation, right? So that that working teams are aligned to streams of delivery, right? That if you've got business value arriving from this solution or component or product or whatever it is, well then there should be a team ar aligned around delivering that, and that the you know the architectural structure should work back from that. There will still always, of course, be what are described here as platform teams, teams who provide core features that are used throughout the organization or by multiple streams or value propositions, but but equally, you know, that the focus should be around a shared purpose, shared consciousness, and then forcing functions. And I guess the key with those forcing functions that 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 often in, in order to achieve organizational change, there has to be some, you know, I don't quite know what to some something to rub it up against in order to drive the friction into the organization to force it to change right most organizations are are typically not going to change very much unless something happens to force that change and these forcing functions may be you know delivery deadlines they may be re or organized statements about requirements they may be you know changes to reporting uh, lines or whatever it is but there has to be some function that that actually forces that change within the organization um, obviously, that doesn't rule out, you know, having competency based teams, right? So if you've got expertise in a user interface technology or in a back end technology or in, you know, some AI tooling or whatever it is, there's going to be teams who are competent in those technologies and they're going to deliver into different stream aligned teams. But that doesn't mean, you know, barring that, that particular competency based delivery, you don't have teams aligned around the delivery. Um, okay. And then I guess a little bit more on what the organization does. And I think this is probably not something that's going to be novel or, or different, but, but maybe a different way of looking at things you already see, right? If we think about how an organization um, plans and understands its activity, right? That might be an, a large organization as a whole, or it might be one of those, you know, focus streams that we talked about in on the last slide in terms of the inverse Conway. Well, 
that there are or there should be a number of things that influence their activities. There are constraints, right? There are perhaps a limited number of resources and a limited deadline, but there may be other constraints on that team or organization or group. And, and I guess the key here is to drive that they be documented and agreed, right? You know, it's, it, everybody has constraints. It's not about trying to remove them, but it is about making sure that they're well understood, that the, the team themselves understand where the constraints are and what, what their, you know, span of control is, but also so that everybody who's interacting with them or has expectations of what they will deliver understand those constraints and how they affect what they may or may not see at the end of this, because that's really important. You know, success is, is defined not just by the team working really hard, but by delivering what the business expects of it. And if there's a constraint that's going to stop that, well, you want that written down at the beginning so everybody can go on and hang on, that's not going to work for us and we need to find a way to modify the constraint. And fitness functions, I guess, are really important. Again, something we talk a lot about in the OAA. They're objective, typically executable tests for non-functional requirements, right? It, you, well, you would take it as given that there are executional tests for functional requirements. If we need to have a product that displays a screen that puts up the following fields, we should have some tests that enforce that. Okay, not everybody in the software in the industry does those things, but but by and large, I think everybody would accept you should. You know, if we're going to produce a car, we should check that there are four wheels on it and they don't fall off and all of the other functional tests you should apply. But fitness functions are that objective, executable form of the non-functional testing about system performance or scalability within fixed resource or um, you know um, other non-functional characteristics be they safety or anything else and i guess the important thing here is making sure that those are objectively constructed but also executable so they can be validated at every point and i guess the reason that's so important in my mind is that, that that's another driver to agility if those things are encoded and executable you're free to modify things and make changes, whether that's code changes or structural changes or deployment changes or whatever it might be, because you know that if you're gonna break one of these fitness functions, you will be informed of that very quickly by this test failing. Whereas if these things are not tested, you get that environment of fear that stifles the agility, you know, because you can't necessarily make change because you're driven out of making the change by the fear that you'll break something that you've no way to validate. And then, Guardrails are really about a, a lightweight governance process. And I guess the key here, I would say, is you know, that about empowering everybody to make decisions which are within their span of control. And the guardrails are almost a way of pointing that out to people, right? You're, you are going to tell them also you know, where they do need to go and ask more people for permission or for approvals or whatever. But largely what you're trying to do is drive out to people that you, know, you do have this span of control and, and, and encouraging them to make the very best possible use of that to solve the problems in the best way possible. Um, and then finally in this section, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about the right environment. And I guess from my mind, you know, the right environment is technical, right? So there's technical characteristics. Again, a lot of these sort of resonate back with some of the things Dave was talking about, continuous delivery, uh, feature toggles, the ability to switch features on and off without re-releasing software, um, you know, a key driver in terms of saying, well, we can't afford to put the feature out even if we're only 80% sure it's going to work. Um, and, um, you know, we, we can um, switch it back off again. And then componentization, that ability to break things down into smaller parts and to evolve each one independently. On the non-technical side, we've got ongoing architectural refactoring, um, which hopefully sort of speaks for itself. And, and I guess an architectural roadmap, right? That ability to say, you know, uh, from the get go, not that we're going to do all these things, but rather to have a guiding star, something that says, yes, this is the direction we're going to take and how it's going to evolve. Yes, tomorrow we might learn something new or we may face a new business requirement in that iterative world that changes that, but but we can always change it, But but you should always know where you're going, even if you know that maybe Ultimately, we won't end up there. Um, and then we talk about, you know, progressive transformation, the ability to iteratively evolve the architecture and your organize, you know, all your, your other elements as, as you were uh, uh, iterate through your product. And then the inverse Conway, which we've talked about as well. So then very finally, um, just because I know yesterday's session talked a little bit about COP26 and, and um, sustainability, I wanted to talk about this briefly. Um, and I think in my mind, at least, um, you know, a, a, a 
as this applies to the OAA, but probably being more generally, there's really two key topics here, I think. One is the greening of IT, right? And that is using IT just to do things more efficiently in, in the IT system itself, right? So whether that's using more efficient resources, so that's maybe moving out of a uh, dedicated data center to cloud-hosted services where, you know, those cloud-hosted services use uh, com computation, hence power and water resources much more efficiently. Um, but also driving to use IT resources more efficiently. And I guess what I'm driving at here is the idea that if we design a new system or evolve a system or whatever it is, in doing that, we may get more insight into how it's using resources. And again, taking the cloud consumption model as a, as a good one, you know, potentially moving from an on-premise environment where you can just see, you know, how much energy is being used by the thing as a whole, where you're using cloud resources, you're probably getting itemized billing for services consumed, you know, disk storage, CPU, um, and, you know, other uh, API calls and things like that. And it can drive the ability to use those things much more efficiency, which of course means you should be using less energy and so on. But then the other track of this is the greening by IT, right? Which is providing people with IT solutions that drive more efficient re use of resources in real life, right? So maybe that's about providing people with digital tools that help them better plan their journeys and make better use of public transport, or whether it's about, you know, digital tools that help people avoid having to travel to do whatever it was, and they can do it remotely and digitally and, and hence do it significantly more efficiently. Um, I have a link embedded there. There's a, it's a Google uh, sponsored, I guess is the right word, course um, about sustainable IT decoded. It takes a couple of hours to complete. It's not terribly long. Kind of interesting talks on these topics and talks on a few others, which I think really um, kind of, you know, brings the green agenda into this, which I think is kind of important and, and hopefully sort of helps bring perhaps some of these to life in a way that can drive adoption um, in in organizations and, and other perspectives where, you know, otherwise this might be just seen as an IT type project. Okay, um, that's kind of me. So I'm gonna stop talking and see if there's questions. I saw a few flash by. Thank you, Patty. Great, great job. I know it's uh, a lot, <clears throat> a lot to cover. Um, and uh, love you. Love the fact that you added the sustainability uh, piece at the at the end there to tie in tie into yesterday. That was really uh, interesting stuff. So uh, one of the things you may have seen flash by was a, a comment from um, uh, somebody very involved in creating the OAA, Frederick Lee. Um, in the next version, his suggestion is is changing uh, the term agile strategy to digital strategy. What do you what do you think of that? That's a, it's an interesting topic. Hello, Frederick, by the way, I haven't talked to you in some time uh, of late. Um, it's certainly something we're considering and we are, and in fact, as well as Steve somewhat knows, actively um, making some changes at the moment, trying to, to get an update together over the next little while. Um, and so what I will do is I'll take the terminology change back. Um, it's interesting because in talking to um, some other collaborators recently, there was a there's a dividing line there where I think some people in their day jobs or their you know their normal life, <laughs> whatever that makes about this one, but anyway, um, you know consider digital to be a slightly focused statement and agile um, is a bit broader, and then there's others for whom digital is that broad statement and agile actually suggests you know engineering and development practices, and. Um, and so I think there's a real um, tension there. I'm not sure what we're actually gonna do, I guess, but, but I'll certainly take the feedback on board. And it is something that's very much at the forefront of our minds, because I think one of the things I think we are feel, we do feel about the way the OAA is structured right now is that there are some assumptions coded into it about our mental model for how these terms fit together, and they don't necessarily match with everybody's experience. So we are gonna try and make it a bit more accessible and, and open up some of that terminology. Thanks, Patty. Um, that good stuff. I think uh, well, we might come back to that one on the on the panel later on as well, because I think uh, there'll be some, as you say, some diverse views on that one possibly. Um, but I think it is a, a it is a one of the challenges with the digital term is it it's as we've 
any other key terms it, it means different things to different people and it can be that very all-encompassing thing or you know um or, or something much narrower so um nice one there so um another question um is there any checklist for efficient it resource or standard for it or anything like that so so it's an interesting question and i'm I am about a million miles from an expert. I am, I've done a little bit of reading recently because a, a collaborator brought it up as we were working on the updates to the OAA. Um, there are international measures for efficiency, but the challenge with them is that they're often focused at the cloud or IT hardware providers. So they are about you know how many kilowatt hours are consumed per MIPS of available compute resources. Um, and that's really good if you want to compare Google to Microsoft to AWS or whatever, but it's not so good for saying, well, Paddy's business application that has the following features and uses, you know, N Kubernetes uh, cubes and X amount of this API call, how efficient is that running on this cloud versus that cloud? It is quite hard to get those things down. And in talking to some of my colleagues and collaborators, the best thing that we've defined at this point, which is probably a little unfair, but I, I would argue it's probably the best available guidance is to say that if Amazon or Google or your cloud provider are charging you more money for something over something else, it is likely that the cheaper object is more efficient. And therefore, if you can drive down based on cost, it is likely that you are driving down based on energy consumption as well. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Um, we'll take one more question now, um, Paddy, and then we'll, we'll move on. Um, you talked, uh, made several references in your presentation to uh, different teams, uh, different types of teams. Um, and some organizations are obviously very small and may not have lots of people to go on different teams. So the, the question is actually, can you speak um, a bit to the applicability of the Open Agile Architecture Standard to smaller organizations? Sure. Um, uh, in fact, I started my career in a very small organization, so I, I've been there and done that. And I guess what I'd argue um, is, you know, I think where I've said teams, we could say role or responsibility. And I guess what I would argue is even if there's two people in a room, there is some division of roles and responsibilities between them. And that's where this kind of thing still becomes important, right? Because you've got to make sure that, you know, the division makes sense and, and is giving you the outcomes you want, even if there's only two of you. Um, but also that that you've covered all the bases, right? Because it's very easy in smaller organizations in particular, in my experience, where you're reliant on that experience of those handful of key people effectively who make up your organization. And if their experience doesn't encompass all of the domains you've got to cover, well, then you're likely to get a gap. And that's hopefully where things like OAA and, and other standards help you look at your organization, small as it may be, in that, you know, through those lenses and say, well, now, hang on, we do have a gap here. And one of us or, you know, whoever many you are needs to take responsibility for this piece of the puzzle as well, or else we will fall short. I, I like that. Think of it as roles. Yeah. So, so you could potentially have people playing more than one role or wearing more than one hat. They just have to remember which hat they're wearing at the time, I guess. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, Paddy. Well, we'll see you back on the panel um, uh, for some more, uh, some more insights, but meanwhile, uh, thank you. Virtual round of applause for Paddy Fagan. Thanks, Paddy.